Signore e signori, grazie. Signore e signori, buonasera e benvenuto a Lekadem Britannica. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the British School of Rome and thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight's presentation is the third in a series of archaeology lectures at the BSR this autumn and picks up the BSR research theme of connectivity in the Mediterranean. Over the past month, we have heard from Professor Massimo Sana, the Superintendent of, po of Pompeii, Ocolano Stabia, on the conservation being undertaken by the Grande Progetto Pompeii. And for those of you who may have missed this event, um, the video is available online from our YouTube site, so if you go to our website, you can catch up on some of the lectures which you may have missed over the past few months. This lecture was followed by another remarkable, um, wonderful lecture by Dr. Mark Bradley, who spoke to us about smell and senses in antiquity. And again, there's a blog available on our website talking about that lecture as well. However, this evening gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Simon Kay, research professor here at the BSR, and Professor and Associate Dean of Archaeology at the University of Southampton. Simon needs very little introduction at the BSR, or indeed in Italy, his name forever synonymous with a particular type of amphora. <laughs> his work at Porters has led our own, has led our own archaeological program since 2007. Since then, Simon has led a series of excavation seasons funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and by the Sopranternenza Speciale per le Colosseo Museo Nazionale Romano e l'Arte Archaeologica di Roma, which has changed our understanding of the port. And the BSR is extremely grateful for the support that the superintendent provides to the project and to the, B and to the school. Builded upon the success of this work, Simon now leads the Portus Lehman Project, an ERC funded research project on Roman ports, and involves six partner institutions, of which the BSR is proud to be one. Tonight, Simon will be speaking on behalf of his team. And it's with great pleasure that I welcome to, uh, back a very close friend of the BSR, Janet Delane, who's here with us tonight. And together, there's also Grant Cox, who's the mastermind behind some of the reconstructions you'll see tonight. And I'm sure they'd be delighted to take some of your questions at the end um, alongside Simon. So without any further ado, please give a warm welcome to Simon Kay, who will be presenting Imagine Importers, Computer Graphic Reconstruction of the Palazzo Imperiale and the Shipyard, excavated by the Porters Project, 2007 to 2014. Thank you. Many thanks, Steve. Um, however hard I try, it's impossible to escape Amphrey. Um, they follow you everywhere. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here again, as ever. It's one of my favorite speaking venues. I love talking here. Um, but um, I should start out by saying that, as with any big project like this one, um, the work that one presents is the work of many people. And Steve has rightly underlined that, particularly in this case, the work that, we're going to, that I'm going to present to you tonight is very much the work of um, Several colleagues, as you can see, um, Janet, who's present, Grant, Graham, and Christina. All of us have worked in differing ways uh, to try and bring um, the challenges and complexities that Porters represent to some form of um, public intelligibility. So um, let's start then. Um, I would hope that by now Porters is a site that is becoming better known. Um, it is a major harbour site, the harbour of Imperial Rome for much of the Imperial period. Um, and it is um, a site which uh, has been known since the at least the 16th century um, and which um, uh, has been discussed and analysed by archaeologists such as Lanciani, Lully, Canina, and many others, and in recent years has seen an upsurge of work. Um, it's a site which needs to be understood in terms of the broader 
support system of Imperial Rome, which of course encompassed Ostia, the Isola Sacra, the River Tiber, the Emporio in Rome, and of course Centum Celae Civita Vecchia. But it is a site which, uh, by virtue of survival, has very, very rich archaeological evidence, but evidence that we would argue is perhaps not as well known as we would like it to be, but evidence which I think has a lot to tell us um, about how a major port like this work, worked. And our evidence of this comes from the building that we've been excavating um, with our Italian colleagues, and which we're going to try and interpret in a way that um, brings across their function and their meaning to you. And really what we want to do in the course of this lecture is uh, introduce you to the reconstruction work that we've been doing on these buildings. Um, not so much to say that um, in antiquity Portus looked like this, hence the title Imagining Portus, because we don't know what they looked like. We can't ever really know. But what we can do is actually um, use the archaeological evidence, um, what there is, um, we can draw upon parallels and we can follow the logic of Roman construction to try and come across simulacra of what might have existed in antiquity in this place and use that as a way of understanding function. Um, here you see an a aerial photograph of, Porta, of the Tiber Delta. Um, see here, um, Portus itself as you, uh, consists of the great Trajanic Basin here and the great Claudian Basin um, with the River Tiber running down here um, and Ostia down to the south. Um, it's a, a, a very extensive site, some three and a half kilo square kilometers. Um, it's, as we all know, um, it was established by the Emperor Claudius, commemorated, amongst other things, by this great inscription now in the gardens of the uh, Duke's Forts of Cesarini. Um, it underwent a major enlargement under the, during the reign of the Emperor Trajan, um, who constructed this great hexagonal basin, um, amongst other things. And it continued as the maritime port of Imperial Rome, right the way through the second, into the third, into the fourth, into the fifth century AD. And then, as we've been able to establish from our own work, but also from the work of Lydia Paroli uh, and others, that there is a, a serious inflection in the late 5th century when the port begins to contract. So by the time of the Byzantine period, Portus is, was not the port that it had been before. Um, and characteristics of this great site is um, it is very extensive, some three kilometers squared. As you can see from this image, it, it is a, it's a very, very beautiful site. It has a very, very varied landscape. There's a lot of very dense vegetation of different kinds, as you can see um, here. Um, it is um, a very fragmented landscape. As you can see, many different landowners, different fields of different sizes all of which impede visual, uh, it makes it difficult to kind of understand um, how one part of the site relates to the other. Everywhere you're shut in by trees. And lovely as they are, it makes it difficult to understand how all of this fitted together and how it might have worked as a port. Um, and it's precisely all those difficulties in terms of visualization that is really what we're trying to do with the 3D model modeling because, of course, 3D modeling allows us to recreate virtually the environment as we understand it from the archaeological and geomorphological evidence. And therefore, it allows us to appreciate the portscape in a way that we can't when we're actually on the site. And one of the reasons for doing this is it that will help people visiting the site understand it, as well as being able to enable, help enable us to answer research questions. So, um, of course, a lot of work has been done at Portus before us. I mentioned that earlier. And when we started this whole process, um, of course, the logical place to begin was, of course, the work undertaken by the great architect Italo Gismondi, um, as you can see up here. 
published in um, Logli and Filibeck's great work in 1935. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a rationalization of an earlier plan by Lanciani uh, in the, 19, the, the 1860s. And it's generally taken to be a fairly accurate map of what survived, and indeed, in many ways, it is. And it was also the, um, the basis for the great Plastico, which now sits in the Porta San Paolo Museum on the Via Ostiense. Um, and so the first place to start, we thought, was to scan, uh, many years ago, we scanned the model, and we thought, well, this is going to be easy. We just scanned Gismondi's work, um, and then we do our work, and we do our modeling, and they just drop it in. But of course, it wasn't quite as straightforward as that. And the more that we prog progressed with our own work, and the more that we progressed with drawing in the work of our geophysical survey and the work of our Italian colleagues, it became clear that um, the Gismondi model um, was very impressive, but in many ways um, there were a lot of details that were inevitably made up and which didn't really stand up to scrutiny. So as you can see there, it was um, perhaps not the right way to begin. So um, we really started off by using the work that we had done uh, with the Geophysical Survey of Portus in 1998 to 2005, um, 2004 in fact, um, and this enabled us to reinterpret um, the standing structures because um, we did our survey all around those um, and to build into those the results of the, the presence of buildings from the geophysical survey. So this is kind of a final plan of all the major buildings that we know about around the port and in its hinterland with its canal um, that put across an idea of a rather simpler, less busy landscape than um, Gismondi's Plastico, a rather more restrained port. And we decided to move ahead and try to build our reconstruction on that basis. Um, and just to give you an idea of some of the differences uh, between um, the work that the geophysics did and the, um, the work that Gismondi did, here you have a detail of his great model, which is still very, very impressive. And this is the um, eastern, the rather the eastern side of the model, and you can see that he hypothesizes on the basis of Lanciani's description a small circular temple here, flanked by granaries. And in fact, here is the geophysical evidence, or rather the interpretation of it, which shows a square temple um, within a temenos, flanked by two great series of warehouses. So there are substantial differences, and this is why we considered it important to proceed in the way we did. The core of our work, though, while we take into account the, um, the, the broader port context, um, the core of our work is, of course, the area where we have been working um, in collaboration with the Superintendenza since 2007. In other words, the area um, of the isthmus between the, Claude, the Trojanic and the Claudian Basin, um, the area of the, the so-called Palazzo Imperiale and the big long buildings that were identified by Lanciani and others. And here you can see a, a representation of the structures, the Palazzo Imperiale, what we've identified as the Imperial Shipyard, and the Grandi Magazzini di Settimio Severo, and two sites where we, in fact, haven't been working. This is where uh, Renato Sebastiani and his team are currently working, and this is an area where we have yet to go move beyond the geophysical stage. Um, here you can see the, um, the, the work that had been done in this area before. This is Lanciani's plan, um, and it shows how he understood the remains at the site based on his very short visit to the site based upon his discussions with people who worked on the site during the clearance of it by uh, the workmen of um, uh, Alessandro Torlonia, and um, three great warehouses. And here you see a rather so more sober uh, interpretation of the remains by Gismondi, 
um, both in terms of the Palazzo Imperiale and, of course, the three warehouses which have become one and which, as I said earlier, for us have become the imperial shipyard. Um, and this is again how Gismondi reconstructs that complex and that's the reality. And um, we do, Lully, however, also uh, produced by uh, Gismondi, or published in the book by Lully and Philibeck, produces this really important section which runs through um, this uh, uh, Cryptoporticus and colonnade in this part of the Palazzo Imperiale. And that is a really important detail that we will come back to um, a little bit later. So that was kind of what we understood before we started the work. Um, and so how we proceeded was um, we, st we were able to uh, take advantage of a plan of uh, the Palazzo Imperiale um, which had been undertaken commissioned by the Superintendenza Beri Beri Archaeologici di Ostia, as it was then, in the 1980s, in which we were able to use. Um, and here you can see a, um, a view of the great monumental facade, um, arcaded facade here. And you can see it's a very distinctive building with this great um, arcaded arched uh, plat uh, support on top of which there would have been a colonnade and you can see that the very um, curious sort of orientation of the um, known structures um, adjacent to it and many of these structures in this part of the plan are actually below ground. The palace complex itself is about 2.8 hectares. Uh, it's surrounded by water on three sides, this side Trajanic Basin, Claudian Basin, Claudian Basin. This is dry land. Um, trapezoidal plan, it's on three stories, and we know this because elements of the three stories survive in, on one part of the site. It was finished towards the end of Trajan's reign. Um, the latest brick stamps tend to congregate about 117, which suggests probably um, that the building staggers into the early reign of Hadrian, in fact. Um, but it's a Trajanic in conception. Um, it has six successive periods of occupation, going right the way down to the 6th century AD, um, and has a major period of redevelopment in the 5th century, which we won't go into. And indeed, everything I say about this building and the other buildings, uh, the Imperial Shipyard, is all more or less to do with the Trajanic period of the mid, early to mid second century AD. So here is an aerial photograph, or rather uh, a satellite photograph, which shows that plan integrated into the, the archaeological reality, um, a very complex palimpsest of squashed structures. We have a surviving basement complex composed of um, very substantial uh, um, uh, vaulted rooms and on top of which we have two compacted floors which have collapsed onto one another um, and there you can see um, early attempts at sort of thinking through uh, volume on that image. So we have the uh, superintendenza plan, we have the site itself, uh, we did additional topographic work um, as Steve knows to his cost um, we've also done very, very in loads of intensive geophysics, magnetometry, um, uh, electri electrical resistance tomography, also ground penetrating radar. Um, and that has enabled us to pick out additional structural details about the Imperial Palace, about which we didn't otherwise know, and which in some ways add to um, our knowledge of that superintendenza plan. And in addition to that, excavations um, since, what, between uh, 2007, right the way up to 2015, although those details aren't on here, um, have enabled us to produce very detailed plans um, for a whole suite of buildings in the northeastern wing of the Imperial Palace, which is where our modelling began. 
Um, and then, of course, here you have a couple of photos of the fully excavated area as it was a couple of years ago um, with a, a big cistern block here, um, a large rectangular room with um, uh, vaulted with a central open uh, peristyle, um, and then a series of rooms um, opening onto a central cistern on the ground floor and um, in Paris, um, uh, impluvium on the first floor. Um, and you have to imagine that this stands to three stories, this would have stood to three stories, this still stands to two with remains of the third story still on top. So it's a very complex building um, but lends itself well to this kind of modelling work. And this is just a detail uh, looking the other way from uh, east to west, showing one of that big room, um, a passageway separating that from the smaller rooms, and then the start of the peristyle area at the top. And in addition to the excavation, very importantly, um, we did um, high-resolution scanning of all of the site, um, all of the uh, area that we've excavated, um, as a sort of intermediate step between doing the excavation and the planning and the modeling. So we were able to use, in some cases, the scanning, um, uh, scan data as a, as a step towards creating the model. And I think it's true to say now that we have most of the Imperial, the Palazzo Imperiale scanned. Um, and it's not only useful for that, of course, it, it makes it possible to do virtual visits of the site um, and uh, it enables us to um, think about ways of presenting it um, to the public more generally. So that gives you a thumbnail sketch of the Imperial Palace. Um, the um, Imperial Shipyard is a very different building and it's um, here to the east of the um, Imperial Palace. 240 meters long, quarter of a kilometer. Uh, represents a certain challenge in um, planning and excavating. 60 metres wide, comprising three building sections, 5.1, 5 5.2 5 and 5.3, um, comprising passages, wide bays and narrow bays. Um, again, same kind of chronology as the Imperial Palace, same architectural conception, six periods of life, again with a uh, important period of reconstruction, but this time in the late second century and again in the fifth. And here you can see some details. This is the northern facade that opened onto the Claudian Basin, blocked up with successive periods of use of the complex. And here is the south side that opened onto the Trajanic Basin, through um, which we believe ships would have been pulled in and out of the water. This is at an, at an early stage of the excavation, but gives you an idea of the width of one of these bays at 11 metres wide by 60 metres long. OK, so that kind of gives, that's the archaeological evidence, which is the real basis to what we've been doing. Um, so as, as far back as 2007 and 8, we realised the importance of, um, at least my colleague Graham Earl was, continually used to tell me, Simon, it's really important we do, we visualize buildings because that way people are going to understand the better and you'll get the benefit from it. And eventually I listened to him and he was absolutely right that you think you understand what it is you're digging, you think you have ideas about how it worked, but it's only when you actually start to try and put it together in a volumetric way that quite often you realize you're wrong and actually you need to rethink it. And so in these early stages, uh, Gareth Beale, who worked with the project, um, did a number of um, reconstructions of different elements like the inside of a cistern, the outside of the cistern block, and then more ambitiously, um, the key side behind the cisterns, um, our late second, early third century AD Ludus, as we thought about it then, the front of the Imperial Palace, and thinking generally about how the model might appear. And this was, as you can see, 2007 to 2010. And we got a lot of really valuable um, ideas about how the site might have worked. 
but it was kind of one of the objectives of the project from the beginning to try and uh, get a much finer appreciation and to, to concentrate a lot on the reconstruction side of things for all the reasons I outlined at the beginning. And so this is where Grant Cox comes in and um, Grant um, is the mastermind behind um, all of these reconstructions. And he's an archaeologist who's, um, a, he's a trained archaeologist who's learnt to use 3D software rather than being uh, a 3D technician, a computer technician who's using archaeological evidence. And we actually think that that's very, very important. It's not to disparage what 3D artists do, but archaeological evidence is very peculiar and you need to understand the kind of some of the subtleties of, of working with it. Um, and the primary data um, consisting of georeference, he drew upon georeference plans, um, scans of the high resolution scans of the kind that you saw in that earlier image, the geophysical data, um, understood all the, the strengths and weaknesses of these, um, and was able to integrate them within a GIS system, a geographical information system. The program that he used for um, doing most of the modeling, I think, uh, was um, 3DS Max. And don't ask me what it is. Um, you'll have to ask him. Um, but he swears by it. And in fact, I think you'll uh, agree with me that the results have been very good. And it seems to be fine for us. And in the process of modeling, he's um, uh, created the geometry, the underlying geometry that is necessary for the creation of all these buildings and indeed the port context into which they all fit. Um, it's, it's to, to the non-specialist, it's a nightmare, but somehow he has navigated his way through it very successfully. Um, he's also, um, one of the things that you need in order to do your modeling is to make them appear like Roman buildings. And you do this by adding textures and rather than taking these off the shelf, so to speak, in every case for different kinds of building material, whether it's opus spicatum, whether it's marble, whether it's brick, opus testatium, or whatever, um, we've gone back to the site, taken photographs, and he's then worked those up to use those for his textures. He's also found, as I think we found on site, that um, a key to understanding the kind of um, internal logic of the buildings and how they would have worked um, and to try and bring that out in the model is the, the role that light plays within these buildings. Um, so, for example, there is a, in the, the ground floor of the Imperial Palace, there are a series of surviving rooms which are very, very dark. And you have to understand as you walk around those with a very powerful torch that actually these were all illuminated not artificially, but with natural light. And the challenge is to understand how that natural light worked. And it does, and it did. And so that was kind of something that we talked through. And he was very careful to bring that out. And, and indeed, Janet did too. And she came to, to help us in the latter stages of the modeling. And also, he undertook what's called faking. In other words, um, making things look like they are there, but they're not really there. Um, it's a way of saving time during the rendering process, which is when you um, give the images solidity and make them look real. Um, and also some of the challenges of dealing with water. And as you'll see, such issues we had to do with try to differentiate between water within the hexagonal basin and water in the Claudian basin. Hexagonal is sheltered, Claudian is not. And important to show that kind of difference. And here is some of the, inter the interminable screens that Grant had to generate in order to move through the modeling. And um, it's a, a very subjective process modeling um, and developing the model. Um, in a sense, Grant was actually developing his skills as the model progressed. So it was a learning process for him as well it was, as it was for us, but in a different way. Um, and um, he had to learn how to balance the um, costs of expensive hardware against uh, producing software to a commercial standard. 
Uh, we can't have the most expensive hard software of all. We just don't have those kind of resources. So we have to make do, and it's finding a balance that works for the models we're creating. A library of assets, a library of uh, objects that can be used in the model itself to make it look like the um, like ships and amphorae and I'm afraid um, and sacks of grain and things of this kind and indeed people that we can use to populate them. Um, and um, when w he's been creating uh, virtual reality, it's not just a matter of um, producing a model which satisfies us or is what the data tells us, but we also have to think a little bit about the people who are going to use this, who are going to see it, how they're going to react to it. So you need to be aware of the, um, how audiences react to visualization. So um, moving forward then with the modeling, um, we can see here um, a, a slide which makes the point how um, the overall model that uh, grants produced is sticking very, very closely to the geophysics. Um, there is the model seen from an aerial view. Um, and around here, you can see uh, brought out, um, highlighted, the, the base interpretative map we produced for the geophysical survey. We deliberately haven't got this building in here, so you can see this is where it would go. But in, in most cases, they are following the, the archaeological evidence. And until very recently, um, we didn't have evidence of these buildings because, of course, um, there is a model being produced for this by Evelyn Bukovici and um, Remy Fabro. And as I'll explain at the end, they are incorporating their results with ours for a, um, a model for future use at Portus. Um, and we now have that evidence and we can now um, draw that into the overall model. So let's walk through the, um, the reconstructions, starting with the Palazzo Imperiale tra uh, tr trogenic date. The first phase of modeling was consisted of those of us. As, um, Janet wasn't with us at this stage. And um, we were modeling the remains of standing buildings. Uh, and we were thinking about um, the width of vaults, um, roofing, different kinds of capitals, and Christina played a really fundamental role here. Um, and the aim was to try and get some initial reflections about the volumes of the buildings. Um, and here you can see the northeastern wing of the Imperial Palace, which is really where we've done our most intensive work. Um, you saw an earlier, earlier aerial photograph of this area, and this is how we kind of started to perceive it in terms of the cistern block, the big rectangular peristyle, and then the lower, the ground floor cistern and the first floor um, peristyle a bit further to the west. And so Grant started to build this up, as you can see in the first stage, that's the, the ground floor um, there. Same structures, cistern, big rectangular room, and then the cistern around with the, um, uh, the pool on the first floor of this curious system of buttresses and so on. And uh, producing some early in, uh, initial uh, interiors, um, that essentially being a view up here, just to sort of see what some of the problems and challenges were in representing brickwork and so on. And then um, building it up to the, fur, to the ground floor, to the first floor, to the second floor. And here you can see how we thought this might work. Um, and then eventually moving to this area, which is very, very challenging indeed, because as I said, it's got a, a cistern on the ground floor and it's got a, a, a pool on the first floor. And uh, it's a structure which also allows light to percolate through into the ground floor, into the first floor, and remembering that there was also a third floor. Um, and here is the ground floor of that structure. Um, and this is the same scene as a scan turned inside out um, where the initial system, the ground floor system is in there and the rooms that open off it are here and the passageway that you saw in the previous image is around here, um, there. 
Okay, there's the curved roof, and there is the curved roof. So it just gives you an idea of very useful this was for building into the model. And this is an attempt to try and represent this curious architectural arrangement with the, um, the ground floor uh, system here with its vaulting, and then the, the top of the vaulting, which is the bottom of the pool, and then the peristyle running around it, and then the um, way we thought about the, how the um, upper part of the room was arranged. And then, uh, don't worry about that detail, but we then build it right up to the um, third floor with a structure that looks a bit like that. Then pop a roof on, and also start playing around with the um, monumental facade of the building of the Imperial Palace. And um, this is the kind of model that we came up with, drawing upon the um, Gismondi base, um, and adding in our own structures, which is what we said we would do initially, but which we were very, then very dissatisfied about because we then knew that there were all sorts of details here which didn't really work and that we really needed to rethink all of that. <coughs> so here you have the Imperial Palace and there you have the, um, the, the Imperial Shipyard. Then um, Janet came in to uh, work with us and provided us with very, very valuable architectural um, uh, advice and input, which essentially allowed us to move from um, a very archaeological perspective of how the building might work to one which um, is informed by a, a much sounder understanding of the architecture, um, I have to say it. Um, and she, there are a series of slides here where you can see the kinds of comments that she was making um, you know, we produced these uh, um, images for her and she said, you know, this is odd. I would have expected the central rectangle to be open. What is this meant to be? Three columns. I can't see why this would work. And this is all common. I put it up simply because we're being very honest about this, that when you're doing this kind of work, you, know, you need to be, you, you've got to get a grip on the, the basics. and You've got to understand the, uh, the context, the, um, the theoretical as well as the practical. This facade is, is not understandable at the scale. The roof gable looks too steep, and so on. Um, other comments. And really what she was getting at is that um, her comment is really, she'd read Lanciani's account, as indeed I have, and one is struck by the fact that Lanciani knew what he was talking about. He recognized this structure as a palace, but what we had created didn't come across to Janet as palatial. And so it was really with structures like this that um, Janet had in mind that she decided we revisit the complex and then try to think how we can do this better. So um, she was particularly interested in the, um, the cryptoporticus at the front of the Imperial Palace, the west facade overlooking the Claudian Basin. Um, when there are a whole series of really interesting details which tell us about how people were able to circulate at ground floor level um, and the relationship between the cryptoporticus at ground floor level and the portico on the first floor. Um, and in thinking about this, she was thinking in terms of um, great colonnaded structures like this villa here. Um, um, she was thinking in terms of colonnaded structures overlooking water, like the facade of the um, uh, Domus Aria overlooking the, um, the lake, um, which was subsequently turned into the Colosseum. So, uh, and also thinking about um, colonnaded structures that often appear on wall paintings from Pompeii and places like that. Again, many of them are idealized, but clearly there was an architectural type where you have long colonnaded structures in a marine or at least an aqueous environment. So Janet was thinking that way, and I had also thought that it, the position of the Imperial Palace complex is also really important because it does sit between this great body of water and that great body of water, um, which is, in a sense, you know, it is in an aqueous environment, a maritime environment, and also recalls great complexes like the um, Butte de Saint-Jean, I think it is, at the port of Fréjus, 
where you have a great uh, so-called palatial complex or an administrative building at a similar position in the port and also at Alexandria, the position of the great palace um, in the uh, eastern basin. So it's a kind of, we're thinking of a palatial structure that draws upon a series of different um, architectural and uh, kinds of traditions. So Janet got to redrawing, uh, to interpreting what we knew from the early superintendents of plan and the geophysics and started moving towards um, a new interpretation of that more or less retaining what we had done before, but getting to grips with all of this. And this is her plan, and these are the kinds of things that she was suggesting in terms of um, the different spaces, um, how the roofing and the vaulting would work, and in particular, the, the position and the role of this semicircular dome structure, which still survives um, on the site. And again, some minor details in the area that we've been working with before. So um, we went back um, and Grant worked away furiously and many emails later and tearing of hair. And we came up with this model, um, for which of course uh, any um, resemblance between this and San Quentin, um, a high security penitentiary establishment, um, may have been an eloquent commentary upon our understanding of the nature of Roman power. Um, but it was a first stage in, in kind of getting to grips with this. And in essence, there are too many windows, they're too small. Um, the Roman buildings just don't work in this way. So um, we rescaled everything and eventually we came up with um, this image, which we all very much like, which shows the Imperial Palace in a state of construction, but with windows in the right kinds of proportion to the spaces um, onto which, into which they let light. And um, it's also nice because you can see um, people and get an idea of scale. Um, and on that basis, we started to work through um, and bring together, um, we, we started to, we had, we'd sorted the Imperial Palace, the, the, the Imperial Shipyard, um, that was fine. Janet was sort of fairly happy with that. Um, but then we had to kind of reconstruct these big buildings here, most of which appeared in the Lanch in the Gismondi model, but I think it's true to say there was not really much evidence for the reasons to why they appear like that. And indeed, there are many other buildings too for which there is no evidence. So we, um, in a sense, drawing upon the model that um, Grant had done of the uh, um, uh, Grandi Magazzini di Settimio Severo here earlier, which you'll see later, um, we drew up a kind of um, a fairly um, anodyne uh, block, which would serve to give a sense of volume with windows. We don't say that they necessarily looked like this in detail, um, but that's how it is. And of course, the nature of the model means that when the evidence for this does come through, we can, of course, just take them out, remove that layer, and put them back in or adjust them in the appropriate way. And here is a detail looking over the Imperial shipyard back towards the Imperial Palace um, and off towards the um, warehouse, Gandhi Magazzini. And we also modeled the Imperial shipyards. Again, this was Grant, Christine and myself and James Miles and Matt Harrison. Um, we um, many decisions working amongst us about um, the width of the potential vaulting if it, they were vaulted, uh, roofs um, uh, and so forth. Um, the greatest, the best parallel for us in a way is the Atarathanas in Seville, which dates to the 12th century, a, a stunningly similar building to our own, and um, used software to calculate, the engineering software to calculate the stress of vaults and roofing on the structure that we proposed to check that it functioned at least in a reasonable way. And this is the kind of building that we eventually came up with. And this is um, an attempt at working through some of those potential stresses in the engineering software undertaken by James Miles. And in addition to that, Grant was all the time working on his assets, working on um, producing amphorae, which we could then pepper around the site. Um, brickwork, 
um, based, as I said at the very beginning, upon details of brickwork of Opus Testatium and Mixtum um, from the site, photographed and then treated and imported into the model, roofing based on roofing tiles. And these um, suggestions for window, again, a suggestion from Janet that we look at the Del Pozzo Paper Museum um, archive where there are some representations of um, uh, Roman buildings, copies of earlier um, paintings that don't survive. But in some cases, you can actually see um, windows uh, um, uh, d decorated in this way, grilled in this way. So we've, we've used those too. So um, the actual state of the model, this is where it is at the moment. And I think we all agree that this is not a static thing. We haven't finished. It's an ongoing process. And as I keep saying to people, it's really actually developed as a research um, tool in its own right. And it can enable us to do a lot of different things. A few points before we dive into these, simply to say that, um, what I, again, what I'm showing you is just, I think there's one exception where it's period three, late second century. Essentially, all the reconstructions are of the Trojanic period, but we've got reconstructions for all of our periods um, from the Trojanic right the way through to the Byzantine period. Um, we're using different kinds. Um, we can, if we want, use different kinds of covering. Um, there was the great debate as to are all the buildings, are the, is the shipyard, for example, was it brick face? Well, it was brick face, but were these, was the brick facing covered with plaster? We know from Evelyn Bukovic's work that the Grandi Magazzini di Traiano, um, at least the area around the Darsena, was actually faced with plaster. And we simply don't know whether this was an exception or whether it was a rule. So in essence, we don't really know what color a lot of the buildings, aside from uh, the facade of the Imperial Palace, were. So, but we can switch those on and off, and we can add things in as better evidence comes to light. We can also, we've chosen to produce the images at, I think it's about midday, is it, Grant? Um, we produce the pictures at a nice time of day. It's a sunny day, but of course we can produce some dawn, dusk, stormy days. I like the idea of stormy days. Important, it's, the Roman Empire wasn't always in the sun. Um, and we can also play around with the um, position of ships and boats and potentially start making interesting calculations about how many boats and ships could use the um, basins at any one particular time. And so here we have the, the model as it uh, A view, and we can take any particular view we want um, of the complex. Uh, the Imperial Palace complex here. Um, the um, uh, Imperial Shipyard. Um, the temple that we showed at the very beginning, which we know most about from the geophysical evidence. Other complexes, warehouses about which we know rather less. The bulk of the structure is there, but the details we don't know about, and the geophysics has helped. Um, and um, we've also added in details like the presence of cranes here along the, um, the uh, Fossa Traiana, cranes here where there is archaeological evidence for them down here, here because it's where the Statium Armorum is. We've also added in evidence from the geophysics, the existence of the road and the, where the aqueduct and other structures which you know, we know about from the geophysical survey um, and so forth and so on and a range of different ship types. Um, all the merchant ships are based on the Madrag de Jean, simply because, which is a um, first century BC ship, simply because um, our colleague Julia Boetto has very kindly let us use her interpretation, and we've built on that, and other ship types, but clearly are there, but clearly we need to develop this more and more. Uh, and as I said before, since we have the exact position of the mooring rings and the uh, columns, the numbered columns um, for ship mooring points, we can actually start to make sensible calculations about how many ships of different sizes and different moments could use this, um, this basin in particular. 
Here is the facade of the um, uh, Imperial Palace complex um, with this very characteristic uh, hemicycle apse. As you can see the darkened area here um, with details of the windows and their grills. Um, this is a view of the interior um, of the basin um, with the mooring rings here and here. These columns, which we some of the bits of them survive around the site, and these great corner, corner columns, which we know about from an inscription found at the site from the famous Trogenic Cistercius and so on. And they also appear at other um, uh, port sites like Pozzuoli um, and the reconstruction of the Grandi Magazzini, the Sitimia Severo there. And we've, as you've seen in this case, we've left the facade as being plastered in this case, but it might not have been that case. This is a view through the um, facade, down the, for the facade of the colonnade with en its engaged columns of the Imperial Palace with the ship passing by. Um, just see the Claudian Basin to the left. Um, of an attempt at um, viewing the interior at this stage, just leaving it completely white because we haven't yet got to grips with how the interior might have been decorated, but hopefully future excavation will allow us to add that kind of detail. And um, the interior of a bath complex, which is actually a 5th century date, but I just thought I'd put it in, um, and it's a, sorry, a, a latrine complex, as you can see here, the, uh, the latrine seat um, and a play of light on the back wall. Um, and then looking Moving away from the Imperial Palace there, you can see the great shipyard um, with the Pharos in the background um, and some ships in the process of being built. Um, a warship here, possibility that warships were um, uh, repaired in, these building, in this building. A, a detail of the facade, um, again showing the, of the Imperial shipyard, showing the um, ships being constructed. A detail of the interior of the, sh of the shipyard, again, just to give an idea of the, um, the wooden roofing that we've come up with. Um, reconstruction of the Grandi Magazzini di Settimia Severo, as you can see there. Um, and an interior of that. And finally, a view towards our current state of the interpretation of the temple complex um, with its statue of Trajan, which Lanciani tells us stood to five meters, um, that actually stands to exactly five meters. And it gives you an idea of scale. Um, um, if we were to put people in here, you probably wouldn't see them. Um, indeed, one of the great shocks of doing this is it, it is so much bigger than you th think it is. Um, and um, I think we underestimate the sheer capacity of cargoes and storage that this, com this port complex was able to accommodate. And finally, a, a kind of an aerial view of the whole complex, um, leaving aside the Isola Sacra, which we haven't yet started to work on, a detail of the Pharos, and indeed including um, Evelyn and uh, Remy's interpretation of the um, Grandi Magazzini, the Settimia Severo down here. And as I said at the beginning, I mean, it seems to me that, um, and I hope you've enjoyed the images, but it seems to me that um, the future of this model, it, it clearly has a, an educational purpose. It's impressive to see, but we really see a future for this model as a research resource. Um, and uh, it's an idealized representation of how the site would have appeared in terms of information that's available. And as new information comes to light, it's inevitably going to be changed. And the model is built with flexibility so that we can continually change things as more work comes to light. And um, the, we have to remember also, for those people who perhaps don't necessarily believe in the value of reconstruction, that in doing all this work, because I, I hoped I've been tried to show, that um, the archaeological evidence for floors and walls is always the starting point for reconstruction. There's always an empirical base. 
Um, another thing we've learned is that it's absolutely fundamental that the archaeologists and the digital artists continually work in collaboration. It's a continual process. Um, and the, as I said earlier, there's also a dialectical relationship between uh, interpretation of the excavation and what happens in the model. And that the more you work with the model, the more you change the excavation and your interpretation. And that can indeed influence the way in which you develop the excavation. Um, and of course, um, very, very important to understand Roman architectural principles um, when trying to do this kind of stuff. It's perhaps um, an obvious point, but one perhaps that's not taken into account as often as it might be. Um, and uh, in terms of the model becoming a default resource for Portus, um, we can see here Remy and Evelyn's model of the Grandi Magazzini di Traiano in one state, and here uh, a, a later stage of reconstruction where we're starting to get a sense of a volumetric structure, um, and all of this is being incorporated into the model. Um, uh, as the model develops to become a resource for um, the archaeological site of Portus, um, that all of us working there can share it and use it and develop it through time. So um, I haven't quite finished. Um, this is the, uh, I'd just like to express our gratitude to uh, many people for their support, both in Italy, both in the UK and both beyond both for the excavation and those for the modeling. Um, however, I would like to um, end by um, turning myself into my colleague Renato Sebastiani, uh, who is the director of excavations at Portus um, and um, is, uh, works for the Soprintendenza Speciali per il Colosseo, uh, Museo Nazionale Romano e Area Archeologica di Roma. Um, Renato was going to be coming here this evening, but sadly he's been struck down by flu um, and he can't make it. But um, he really wanted me to end up, if I can test your patience just a little bit longer, um, with a few points um, that essentially are about the fact that um, the work that we've been doing at Portus is a key stage, and it's, it's work we've been doing together, it is a key stage in developing a digital strategy for Portus, um, the, the whole site and not just our excavations. Um, the reconstructions and the digital models are important instruments for research, uh, evaluation and enjoyment of the archaeological heritage and the formation of young archaeologists for the management of the archaeological heritage in the future. And, um, it's building upon our joint work with the superintendency uh, in the Portus project and the Atelier Osti Portus um, to do this in recent years. And a kind of first stage in this is, in a sense, the model itself, um, but it's also the Portus Tour website, which is very shortly to be launched um, by the um, superintendenza. It's been done with um, the uh, Portus project and the superintendency and it's really a, a, an online um, visitor facility and it enables you to visit all these different places online with texts and images of Portus all the way through its history and we hope that that will be online very soon. Um, and over the next three years um, the SS Col, the Superintendenza Speciale, wants to um, create, as you can see there, an integrated system for activities uh, involving not just the superintendency, um, but also research projects and centers um, from Italy, from beyond, um, to involve in, the create, in, in contributing to the uh, virtual models of the Port of Claudius and Trajan that you've seen. Um, and uh, every project working there is going to have to produce um, uh, digital data which will allow 2D and 3D reconstructions to be created. Um, similarly, um, creating a digital topographical base so that all our plans and everything fit together. Um, and 
moving onwards from that, uh, try to create a website which will um, support apps, which will allow people to visit the site and um, uh, use iPhones and so on to find their way around the site, to have the reconstructions which will enable them to understand what they're looking at rather better than they otherwise would uh, in the context of the, uh, the site. Uh, and they're currently in the process of trying to uh, set up a new visitor um, route uh, with new panels, um, which have got QR codes, which uh, are similar to those that um, Ostia and, and in the future Isola Sacra, and indeed at Rome in the uh, Rionita Statue. So that's where Renato, if he'd been here, would have wanted to have said that um, this is, as I said earlier, it's become a research resource, but it's one that is integrated within the work that the Superintendent is doing in collaboration um, with its colleagues. So, um, I'd just like to finally say that um, outside, afterwards, there is a, a computer screen and there's a continual series of reconstruction images visible for those that want to see them. But thanks for your patience. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Simon, for this um, fascinating lecture. At this point, can I invite um, both Grant Cox and uh, Janet Delane to join uh, Simon up here? If that's okay. No. <laughs> you can't escape. Um, from my own personal point of view, I've had the uh, pleasure of working alongside um, Simon um, over the past few years on the very be from the very beginning of the project when we started out in 2007. Um, and it's fascinating, certainly from my point of view, to see the development, um, not only archaeologically, but also with the, um, with the reconstruction as well as we've worked from the very early stages of the excavation where we're very fortunate to have um, uh, computer graphic people on site and to see the work in process of producing something on site where we are very lucky to use a, a house or Kazali on site where we can use to reuse those on site and then to see them for Simon to use that on site to then come back and change it so um, so for my, my, for my experience of working alongside for the topographic work it's been very interesting to, uh, to see that side of the work um, at this point, I wonder if I can open up the floor um, to see if there's anyone who has any specific questions, um, any questions for um, the, the team here, um, uh, all three of them, who, any aspects of the, um, of the work that they've, um, uh, you've seen this evening. I was just wondering, um, for the reconstructions, do you have any columns or drains that would that give you heights or um, like indications where the water would come down from roofs or anything like that? Um, we don't have any columns per se. We have the emplacement of some column bases, but um, <coughs> uh, and we have one column capital. So, um, but apart from that, it's a site which has been picked clean essentially. Um, you have to imagine all that superstructure, essentially the third floor has virtually completely gone and much of the superstructure of the um, shipyard has also gone. Uh, quite when this happened, I don't know, um, but it's clearly been very systematically robbed. So much of that's gone, but we do have in Lanciani's account um, reference to a large number of fragments that exist and I imagine that a lot of them got sent up to Rome and to be recorded as having come from Ostia, probably. So, um, <clears throat> but in terms of drainage, very, very difficult. I mean, indeed, the, the, the best... Well, there are two places where we can talk about that. One is actually in that sort of cistern peristyle, um, where it's very, very clear it survives. 
um, and you can see how light flows and you can see how the water would have worked in the basin. <coughs> the other area is, of course, on the frontage of the um, Palazzo Imperiale, where you've got that cryptoportico, then you've got a series of light wells coming at the front. And I think you've also got um, holes in the floor on the uh, uh, passage on the top, which allowed for water to come through, if I remember rightly. Where are you? Um, <laughs> on the top of the cryptoportico, those holes which allow... Which, which are light wells, yeah. That's right, yes. Presumably the water might and go the down water when, yeah. when the seams mm -hmm. goes down. One of the things that Lanciani does say in his brief description is that that area is really impressive for the height of the buildings. So clearly we are writing taking things up um, beyond ankle height, or <laughs> this kind of height. <coughs> yes, I think it, it's also true to say that it's hard to appreciate that when you look at the site. But there are parts of the site that have clearly been demolished were, were demolished at that time um, and you know you the effort that's gone into it is such that you can see how it would be that what Lanciani clearly saw is no longer there um, I wonder if this you, your, the present the model you've shown so far is, if you said at the beginning very much was based upon the Trojanic phase mm. um, are you going to for, from the excavation data we have, look to build that into the sort of, there's that very important fifth century stage as mm. well at um, Porters, where we have that um, change in function in particular from your own excavations from the, um, the Navalia into warehouses as well. I wonder, I imagine, I wonder is that going to be another process, another step that you're going to take within the, within the modeling? We've already done it. Um, <laughs> Poor old Grant has soldiered through all, all seven phases of it, I think. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Were there any particular challenges? Uh, well, the main thing is that there's the, model, the model's not really like a production model. So usually you would uh, you build a model specifically for a certain storyboard or shots that you were trying to. Right. Am I quiet on this? No, it's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, usually you're trying to build a model for a particular storyboard or series of shots that someone might come up with uh, when you're doing previsualization or planning for an animation. But with the Portis model, everything has to be ready uh, all of the time. So it's the biggest difficulty is really fitting everything into the model and keeping the, the weight of the model down so that any of those shots that represent the archaeology can be shown at whenever is necessary and that's quite a difficult thing to do over a site that's you know there's, there's almost I think about one and a half kilometers of, of of content in that model so it's it's not an average computer model made for a set path where things happen and it's very um, dense specifically for where the camera's looking everywhere needs to be ready whenever it's necessary so that's really the main limitation um, and difficulty with it. Yeah, and we do have, we, as I say, we've got Grant can switch on the changes that happen through time. So we can add the uh, late second, early centuries, early third century AD ludus that can then appear. We can then bring in the fifth century walls. We can then take out um, the Trojanic structures, and um, so we already have that facility. But we would have been here till midnight if, <laughs> if we'd um, gone into all of that. So any further questions? Anyone else have any, anything they urge to ask some of these speakers? Um, yes, yes. Well, um, there is uh, there was always a dirt path that we put into the models. Um, the trouble is obviously building the multiple variations of the model. Things you saw with the list of shaders, things tend to get very complicated. So the way that uh, 
people tend to overcome that is by adding dirt in at the end. And there are actually dirt passes on those shots. Um, <laughs> so it, it's interesting because when it comes out of the render, it's very clean. And then I add the dirt passes in. Uh, and deciding what level it is, again, a subjective thing. So it, it can be, mu and, and, and also the different levels of dirt. You could have dirt from rain washing down the windowsills, or, and this is an area that Simon s briefly mentioned where he said that we're currently, we're pushing the core software to its limits. We're trying to do as much as we can with 3ds Max out of the box so that if in a year's time or two years time a undergrad student or a master student opened that model he would be able to open it and straight away see everything in the model he might not understand it but he'd have access to it and when you start moving into the production side of things and you're dealing with licenses and programs that are expensive you get to the point where you could send that model to someone and they'd open it and half the things wouldn't work. So really, to answer your question, the dirt's there. There are better ways to do it. But at the moment, we're constrained by the tools we're working with to produce a very base model. But if someone was to come in and say, ask us to do a documentary where we could plan for having a specific um, series of shots, then we could really go to town using those extra areas to uh, develop that side of it but at the moment each shot's taking about three hours to render so and then we're having to do the basic things inside the software to really add to that does that answer your question okay good um i was just wondering if you could say a bit more specifically about the fifth century redevelopment of the site um because it sounded like there was some quite important changes Yes, um, this is really kind of born out of the most recent excavations where um, sometime in the fourth, my intuition is it's within the fifth, but how far in the fifth it's difficult to say. The members of the team were continually talking about this. Um, <clears throat> but what you see happen is a lot of the old trigenic decoration in some of those more noble rooms, if you like, is scoured out and a lot of them are redecorated with upper secular pavements uh, on the floor and also um, some decoration on the walls as well and we get an enlargement of um, uh, in the space between the um, south side of the north wing of the palace and the shipyard we get a, a whole um, a um, a strip of rooms which are uh, very highly decorated as well <clears throat> and this de uh, this as I say is kind of no expenses spared for this um, and it's clearly part of a major restructuration of the palace precisely what it means is difficult to say at this stage but um, it's in the context of we know from the literary evidence from people like Sidonius Apollinaris and other sources um, that cargoes are still coming into the port at this stage. But I think what it tells us is that the state is still regarding this complex as a key node for importing foodstuff to the city. It was administratively important. Um, but um, it's really, I think, the only part of the site, apart from Lydia Proli's work at the Basilica, where we have good evidence for the changing nature of the port at this time. Is there any further questions? Okay, at this point, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to thank um, from all of us on uh, Simon and all of his team, along with uh, those who can't be present tonight, and also um, Renata Spastiani, again, who can't be with us tonight, um, to thank them for a wonderful presentation and uh, insight into Portus, um, both in the, in the past and in the future as well. So please join me in thanking them for tonight's talk.